Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. This Wednesday night, I'd like to talk about a chapter in Matthew that's to a large extent uh, misunderstood. If you turn to Matthew 24, and of course, many Christians are familiar with the chapter. It is very easy to see this chapter being directed to us, the church, that, that its direct application is to the church, uh, members of the body of Christ, uh, those elect, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, uh, presently alive in this, at this present time, the present age of grace. Uh, there is, uh, he's talking to his uh, apostles, his disciples. They came to him and asked him uh, to explain to them what would be the signs of his near return and the end of the age. Uh, this is basically what the entire chapter deals with in, in the response that Jesus gave to his disciples concerning his, uh, his returning. And I cannot emphasize enough to you folks just how important it is that we not read in something into the text that's not there. I've often talked about the importance of context. Everything that we say in life has a context. If we look at something and read it apart from the context, we're treading on very dangerous, dangerous ground it, it, as far as biblical interpretation is concerned. Uh, we are told in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In Matthew 24, in my opinion, is a classic example of how we need to do that, of why we need to do that. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 uh, the Holy Spirit through Paul talks about uh, a stewardship of God's grace that was given Paul for you and me. The word stewardship is uh, basically uh, the word dispensation. Uh, dispensation is a word in biblical terms. What we're talking about when we talk about dispensation is we're talking about a particular way that God deals with His people at any particular time in human history. He's not dealing with Israel the way He's dealing with the church. He's not dealing with the church the way He's dealt with Israel or is going to deal with Israel. And these have to be rightly divided. They have to be kept separate in our thinking as we move forward through the whatever text that we're looking at. Uh, this is why this ministry is dispensational in its theology. We, we understand that there was no church before Acts and that in Matthew 24, he's talking to his disciples and it, it would probably come to a shock, be, come as a shock to most Christians to, uh, to learn that there was not a single Christian alive at the time that Jesus spoke these words. Not a single believer baptized into the body of Christ. Not a single one of these disciples had been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, given the fullness of the Spirit, the very triune God living inside them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, made one with Christ. There are many truths in the New Testament that are applicable to them as far as being... Uh, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were all chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. But they lived at a different time. They, were, they resided within a particular dispensation in which God was dealing with them accordingly. 
and uh, dispensational uh, ism is is basically a way of administrating. God is, uh, you know, we have a, a an administration in the White House every four years or eight years or whatever. They have a different way of administering, you know, the uh, the policies that they put present put forward, uh, and, and likewise in the same manner. God does the same thing. He, he's not dealing with the church as He dealt with Israel, nor will He deal with Israel as He's dealt with the church. There are many truths that do overlap, okay, but that distinction has to be made if we're to understand the context of Matthew 24 and glean from it the message that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. There were no church. There was no churches. There were synagogues. These were early Jewish Christians who uh, had never it, it never even entered their mind that they would be one with Christ. And you know, of course, you know he he, he spoke about that. Jesus did in John chapter seventeen and his high priestly prayer to the Father. He spoke many truths that were applicable to us today as well. Uh, but there's a big difference, a huge difference between the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is basically uh, dealing with Christ and His humanity. Uh, Christ came. He came offering the kingdom. They rejected, Israel rejected both its king, its, its Messiah, as well as the kingdom. And God set them aside so that salvation could come to the Gentiles, and that's you and I. And of course that happened. He set them aside in unbelief, but he's but he's that doesn't mean he's finished with Israel. He's gonna come come back in the picture, God is, and he's going to complete his program for Israel, uh, sort of where he left off. And you have to look at the church as a parenthesis in between because the church was a mystery. It was a mystery. Uh, you will you will not here's what you won't see in Matthew 24 you won't see a rapture you know it's eisegesis reading into the text something that's not there to suggest that that his references to his second coming uh, have to do with with the rapture it's that's just incorrect there were no Christians the church was a mystery there's no rapture uh, there really are no overlapping signs now there may you may read through Matthew 24 and you may say, well, look, Steve, you know, I'm looking at a whole lot of signs and it sure, I'm looking around me and it sure seems like all, a lot of this stuff is happening. And folks, listen, dearly beloved, the context is the period that follows from, well, the beginning of, of the tribulation. It, has, it doesn't have the rapture in view at all. It describes events that occurred during Daniel's 70th week and inside that seven-year period up to the second coming of Christ. This is what the chapter does. And if we see any overlapping signs, it's probably a, you know, uh, just, I won't say coincidence. So you know I don't believe in coincidences. We, we, we serve a sovereign God. He's supremely sovereign. There are no coincidences but there can be signs in our present age and I and I have to put that in quotes because there really are no signs that precede the rapture of the church once Israel became a nation again well that was it and the rapture is imminent the second coming is not imminent if you're if you're waiting for the if you don't believe in the rapture and you're waiting for the second coming, it's not imminent. You're gonna know if you are a tribulation saint. You're gonna, and particularly if you are a tribulation saint, you're gonna know that the end is near. There's just no comparison to these signs that we see today and the signs that we see in Matthew 24, mainly because the signs that we look at here in Matthew 24 are in the context of a time period in which we're not in. I, I don't know how to put it any simpler than that. Verse 8 says that these are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. 
Okay? I'm suggesting to you that we are, are not living at a time in which we have seen the beginning of sorrows that are described in Matthew 24. Neither are we living at a time in which we see many of the false prophets that are spoken of in Matthew 24. That's in verse 11 because con of context. It's talking about a particular time period. And Christians everywhere uh, seem to find, uh, uh, well, they, 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 did, they just seem to not, they, by ignoring context, they, they seem to get lost in a, in a myriad of contradictions. One of the primary uh, reasons why this is, is, is we're looking at in Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of Christ that we preach. If you follow this channel, you, uh, well, you may not agree with the, what I believe to be the gospel, the gospel that this ministry preaches, but we're living in an age in which we preach the gospel of Christ. And if you uh, are more interested in that, you could, I, could, I, I would suggest you go back and, and begin following through our, our verse by verse studies through Ephesians or Romans you'll at least understand where we stand concerning the gospel, but this is not what is preached during the tribulation period because the church is gone. What is preached during the tribulation period is, a, is, a, is sort of a pickup again where John the Baptist left off that the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the church was a mystery and the church is a parenthesis. We look at, we see the midpoint of the tribulation mentioned in Matthew 24. The midpoint of the tribulation. There's no church, there's no rapture, there's not a Christian alive, not a single soul on earth. There's a, at, at the time these words were spoken, there were no Christians. Christians were first start called Christians at Antioch. The word Christian means Christ ones. Not a single one on earth at the time Jesus spoke these words. The temptation is to, and I suppose much of that is just out of anticipation and looking forward to the rapture. The temptation is to, is to, is to just open the, the chapter, the 24th chapter of Matthew and just and see that, well, this, well, Steve, this, this is it. This is it. I mean, you know, look at what's going on. Look at, look at what it, Jesus said. It's, it's happening right now. Folks, it's not happening. It's not happening. Verse 13, uh, well, let me back up a minute. It, it's, we're looking at the mid, midpoint in Matthew 24. We're looking at the, the great tribulation itself. That's the second half of the, the tribulation. Uh, the abomination of desolation. Uh, God's, uh, uh, Jesus, God Himself in the flesh, talking to His disciples about this... Uh, Abom abomination of desolation, this, the, the second advent. You don't see any mention of the rapture, and if there was, you would think that it would be at the top of the page, but it's not at the top of the page or the bottom. It's not at the beginning of the chapter. It's not at the end of the chapter. There's no church. There's no rapture. Verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. If, you go, if you're a Christian today and you're going around telling other Christians, look, man, you've got to endure until the end because you know, that's the only way you'll be saved. You're lying to people. I don't know how to put it any blunter, more blunt than that. It's just not true. Christians today do not have to endure until the end to be saved. Christians today are, are born again by the grace of God not because of anything that they did. This, uh, this message here tonight on Wednesday night here, this is not a gospel message. It's kind of hard for me to keep the gospel out of it. But folks, we don't persevere on, on our own in order to make it. it is not, heaven is not uh, just uh, something that's reserved in the future for those who qualify. We're saved by the grace of God. We're kept by the grace of God. It is, 
verse 13, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be delivered. That's not even the word redeemed, it's delivered. And delivered to what? Delivered into the kingdom age. He that shall endure unto the end, that is his elect. That's not the non-elect. The same shall be delivered. Delivered to what? In, into the kingdom age. And it's important that we understand that we have other scripture to come in alongside all of this and confirm this, the context of this. The same shall be saved. Enduring unto the end. It's only a seven year period, folks. And that's verse 13. Verse 14, in this gospel of the kingdom, there we have the, the very gospel of the kingdom mentioned, shall be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the what? Rapture come? No. Then shall the end come. We're still looking at a seven year period in human history that is distinctly separate from any other time in human history. This gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. If you use that verse to say, well, Steve, you know, we're, we today, we're preaching the gospel of the kingdom in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and we haven't done that yet, but when we, when we do, you know, then the end will come. You're misinterpreting the text. In verse 15, we see the midpoint. We're way past the rapture. We're three and a half years past the rapture. No mention of the rapture. Why? Once again, there's no mention of the rapture because the church is not in view. I'll say it again. Christ came unto His own. His own received Him not. He came, Israel's King, Israel's Messiah, offering the kingdom. They rejected both. And God set Israel aside in unbelief so that salvation could come to you and I. And we have to keep that in mind as we study through this chapter. Verse 22, if those days, what days? The tribulation period. If those days had not been cut short. He's not cutting short the church age. If those days had not been cut short, nobody would be delivered. No saint would be delivered. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. What is that saying? It's only seven years. Folks, you'll never cut a day short. You'll never, there's always 24 hours in a day. I don't care when you lived in human history, there's always 24 hours, or roughly that. It's not less days than what, you know, well, God said over here it's going to be so many days, and now, and here it says it'll be cut short, so now God's confusing us, and we don't know how many days. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What days? The last seven years before Christ returns. Unless they were shortened, there should no flesh be saved. You've got to see the severity of, of Daniel's 70th week in, in those words. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. No flesh. No flesh. Now that's not talking about the elect. That's talking about any flesh. Any human flesh. No flesh shall be delivered unless those days be shortened. Why? Because it's such an intense period in human history, a time of God's wrath and judgment on mankind. Day, the word day, figuratively, that's a, it's a period. It's always defined by the context. The word day is always defined by the context. The day can mean a 24-hour period, or it can mean an, a, a period of time. It can, it can mean an age. In this case, it's a period of time. It's an age. Unless those days, that age had been cut short, no flesh would be saved. Verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That is not happening today. Okay? Now look, I'm not asking anyone out there to, to agree with me. I will tell you that there are millions who agree with me. You have to study this on your own and decide for yourself 
what the context of this is. Surely we have false Christs today, false prophets. Uh, we, you could even say they're showing great signs and wonders. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In fact, it's a very interesting verse because in the same way today, the elect are deceived. They are being deceived today. This is a religious context. That's the amazing thing about it. But we don't want to get the two dispensations confused or mixed up. Verse 29 really sets the context, folks. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, a very particular time period. It's talking about Daniel's 70th week. After the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign, the what? The rapture? No. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That's the second advent. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 30, second coming. Second coming. Just note the chronological order of things within the chapter, within our Lord's words. If Matthew 24 were signs preceding the rapture of the church, we would not be in the context of Daniel's 70th week. We would see a rapture of the church instead of the second advent. But that was reserved for Paul and Thessalonians. Verse 31, uh, He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. That's not the rapture. And they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The gathering of what? Of who? Tribulation saints. Not us. Why does He gather them together at that time? Well, actually, we have a verse that says they're left. They're not taken. Those that are taken are taken for judgment. Those that are left are left to go into the kingdom, alive into the kingdom to populate, repopulate the kingdom. There's going to be a devastating loss of life during that period. The gathering of tribulation saints, not us. Verse 32, we get into the parable of the fig tree. You know, everybody's familiar with the verse. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So we can tell by the season, is what he's saying. Likewise, so likewise, ye, when you shall see all these things, all these things, know that it is near. What is the it? The second coming. It is near even at the doors. It, that is the second coming of Christ. Verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation, and this is, this is what led me to do this video. There's a number of, uh, I just kind of stumbled on by accident, uh, several uh, Bible teachers on YouTube that were talking about this generation of ours today. It's not going to pass till all these things be fulfilled. Baloney, okay? It's, you know, it's not talking about our generation at all. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things that he's talked about be fulfilled inside Daniel's 70th week. Well, no wonder. No wonder. It's only seven years. Verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verses, if you go back to, well, verse 36 and 37, but of that day and hour, now let's keep it in context. See, Steve, that's got to be talking about the rapture. Baloney. I'm, I'm, I don't know when I started saying baloney. I, this past couple of weeks, I've been saying baloney a lot. I guess, I don't know. I, uh, part of that maybe because I've been eating baloney, but it's... Uh, I've also been seeing a lot of baloney. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. What day and hour is he talking about? Of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also 
shall the coming of the Son of Man be? That's not the rapture. That's the second advent of Jesus Christ. That's the day and the hour that it's talking about. It's not talking about the rapture. In fact, that's not only not referring to the rapture, just, well, just, just read in verse 31. All right, And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That is not referring to the rapture, folks. 1 Thessalonians, if we go over to the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, verse 4, it says, Paul says, Holy Spirit says through Paul, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Okay? That is referring to the rapture. Now you're in the right context of the rapture. In Matthew 24, you're not. Verse 39, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Second advent. Then, then at that time, shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Not the rapture. It's not talking about the rapture. Two women shall be grinding at the mule. The one shall be taken and the other left. That's not referring to the rapture. If you are a tribulation saint at that time, you do not want to be left. Uh, well, let me back that. Let me hold on a minute. You don't want to be taken. You don't want to be taken. The angels will come and gather up the non-elect for judgment. Those who are left are left alive after all the devastation to enter into the kingdom period and populate the kingdom. Now at the rapture, you, 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 know, you, you don't want to be left. You want to be taken. But here, it's just the opposite. You don't want to be taken. You want to be left. Of course, you don't have a choice in the matter. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in this present dispensation, you're not going to be here during this time period. That's, you know, this ministry is pre trib. We believe in a rapture. You may not. You don't have to agree with me on anything, but I'm trying to impress upon you the importance of context. This is not just a, a study, a, a look at uh, you know, the difference between Israel and the church in Matthew 24. This is a lesson in the importance of studying to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The rightly dividing has everything to do with God's working, dealing with Israel versus the church or vice versa. The two women grinding at the mill, the one taking the other left. That is not referring to the rapture. Verse 42, watch therefore for you. So there's watching during that period. Why? Because the Lord's coming back. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You don't know. Now notice he doesn't say you don't, the, the day, the period. They don't know the hour. Now that's not referring to the rapture. And there is where, folks, the five virgins, I say five, okay, with oil in their, because those, those are the ones with oil in their lamps. That's where those five virgins with oil in their lamps come in in the next chapter, chapter 25. Just go over the next chapter, chapter 25, and you'll read about the ten virgins. It is not speaking of the church at all. There are no virgins Ten, there is no ten virgins in the church age. It is expressly talking about those. It's it's that it's a very interesting study. I invite you to spend some time studying that. The parable of the ten virgins has no application to the church age and believers living within the church age today at all. None. You don't. Don't walk up to me as a believer in the, in the body of Christ, born again by the, the Holy Spirit of God, indwelt by the very fullness of the Spirit of God, living in, in the church age. Don't walk up to me and tell me that you are a virgin with oil in your lamps. In your lamp. Don't, don't do that. Because you're not. You may, you know, you may want to be. 
may sound good to say that. You know, it's, I, I totally get that. But you're not. Don't, don't make the wrong application to yourself. Don't apply to yourself some truth that's applicable to someone else. Folk, folks, listen. These dispensations are extremely important. It, it, especially when it comes to our understanding of the Word of God. The chronological order, the context, the, the, the dispensations, how God is working. Today He's working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. Will He, will he still be working in the tribulation saint according to His good will and pleasure? Well, I, I believe He will. Yeah. It's the way He's working that's different. There will not be one single tribulation saint who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Not one. If you are a member of the body of Christ today, the church, you are a member of His body, bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh. The church is unique. Unique. And I, I, I would write that with a capital U. There's nothing like the church. God is not even imputing men's trespasses against them during this present age. Matthew 25, then the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of the heavens. Now, see, Steve, that's talking about heaven. The, uh, the phrase kingdom of the heavens is a phrase commonly used to refer to the kingdom age. The kingdom of the heavens. That's, that's the kingdom period. The kingdom age. And it's likened to ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. They went out, they, they were ready, they were watching, they were ready for His second coming. For whatever reason, God only knows, they were not baptized into the body of Christ, they were not members of His body, the church. They found themselves in, or they were born inside, you know, the tribulation period. Of course, those, you know what I believe about babies. Christ uh, fully uh, satisfied that God concerning the, the penalty against sin when Christ died. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Babies don't go to hell. You know, five of these virgins were wise. Five were foolish. The foolish ones were, were those who didn't have oil in their lamps. They weren't, they weren't watching. They weren't waiting. The, king, the message of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the invitation to the kingdom goes out during that period. Some hear, some don't. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their lamps, in their vessels with their lamps. That's not talking about church age saints watching for the rapture. After the rapture, Matthew 24 will have a direct application, folks, to the tribulation period saints because the church age has concluded, therefore, God again turns His attention again, once again, on delivering His people Israel as well as elect those elect Gentiles during that period. Okay? The church is a parenthesis between the time these words were spoken if if you took that parenthesis and you just took it out of the out of the way out moved it out of out of the way took it out of the Bible I'm not saying literally don't please don't do that I'm not suggesting you do any such thing as that but if you just took that parenthesis away it goes right from Matthew 24 into Revelation folks we can't we our job as Noble Bereans is to take in out of the text what's there. That's what we call exegesis. Eisegesis, on the other hand, is taking out of the text. Well, it's the interpretation of a text, any text, as as of the Bible, by reading into it one's own ideas. Do not pick up Matthew twenty-four and just go through there and read through through that and, and insert your own ideas or you know, interpret it out of context where that it's a, it is a confusing mess both to you and everyone else who hears you. 
We are, once again, I remind you, we're to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do I believe the Lord is coming back soon? I absolutely do. I, without a doubt. Okay? Without a doubt. But not... But not within, not because of the of, of the context, or not because of everything that I'm reading in Matthew 24. the The church has its own unique set of, uh, I would say, indicators. If you, I don't know if you want to call them signs, folks. It, just the numbers alone, the math suggests that we're nearing the end of the age. What is comforting about this to us is we can get a glimpse into how God is, is, has not, is, is faithful. We see God how, how faithful Jesus Christ is toward His people Israel. He hasn't abandoned them just because there was a print, this parenthesis called the church. He's going to come back and, or He's going to come back into the picture as soon as the church is gone. He's going to complete the program that He began with Israel. He's, the, the deliverance that He promised His people will happen. It will happen at His own timing. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for bearing with me. Once again, I don't ask anyone to agree. Just think about it. This is Steve. We love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.